Okay, guys, good afternoon again. And uh, here is what I promised today in the lecture, a short recording just to complete the outstanding material from today's class. So let's not waste any time. Let's go straight to the slideshow where we have stopped today. And uh, I believe this is what I have said. We are to start from this particular slide. This is the first one, or this is the last one that you and I covered, lacrimal apparatus. And then the next one is about muscles that will be attached externally to the eyeball. So just to bring us back on the same track, we talked here about lacrimal gland in the upper lateral quadrant of the orbit, and then punctum on both upper and lower eyelid with superior and inferior canaliculi that will drain tears from conjunctival sac. And as both canaliculi would kind of go together, they're going to join into lacrimal sac, which becomes truly the beginning of what is called the nasolacrimal duct. It passes through the lacrimal bone, which has sufficient size opening to allow the duct to practically continue. And the inferior most end opening is within a nasal cavity under or inferior to the inferior nasal conha. As mentioned during the lecture, there are a total of six extraocular muscles. Four of them are simply called rectus, superior rectus, inferior rectus medialis, and rectus lateralis. So practically covering top, bottom, left, and right medial and lateral side. And then we have two obliquely running muscles that are also part of this group. Levator palpebrae superioris is the muscle that we mentioned earlier today, but it is muscle which only lifts the upper eyelid. It doesn't get involved in any movement of the eyeball. Superior rectus colored in orange. And as you can see, arrows that are illustrated here are pointing out directly as what would be the movement of the eyeball if this muscle acts alone. So we would simply raise the eyeballs up and look up as I'm trying to do right now in front of camera. Elevates the eye and it can add a little bit to uh, adduction and medial rotation when it works uh, with other muscles. Inferior rectus, colored in pink, and if observed alone, obviously the attachment point of this muscle to the eyeball will cause the eyes to be depressed as when we try to look something down. Also will be helpful with adduction and lateral rotation of the eye, working with other muscles. Medial and lateral rectus appear to be muscles that are having practically straightforward function. This is the lateral rectus in blue. And of course, should this muscle act alone, I will deviate outward. So we can say the eye is abducted and opposite side, the rectus medialis would adduct the eye. So we have to keep in mind that we have two eyeballs. So when the one is abducted, like my right eye, so if I want to see something on the right, the left eye, has to be adducted so that both eyes can focus on the same object that we observe. For muscles that are superior, inferior, and medial rectus, they are innervated by the same cranial nerve, oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve number three, while the lateral rectus is innervated by itself with cranial nerve number six, which is abducens nerve. This diagram also includes, and we can see it very directly, the yellow colored superior oblique muscle, where you can see the belly of a muscle runs practically parallel to levator palpebrae superioris or to rectus superior, but that, then it goes under the hook, which really like makes pretty much sharp turn of its 
tendon before it attaches to the back of the eyeball. So we have superior and inferior oblique muscles. Here is the superior oblique, as we see it from the above in yellow color. It goes under this hook or trochlea, and then it is passing with its tendon of insertion from medial to lateral and anterior to posterior direction. That is superior oblique muscle. The name of the nerve that innervates it, it's the trochlear nerve. That's the cranial nerve number four. And action of this muscle is a little bit more complicated because of its obliquely running tendon and a pulley that the trochlea ensures. This muscle will be able to abduct the eyeball, to depress it, and to medially rotate the eyeball. In green color, we have inferior oblique muscle. The reason you see it a bit shaded is because this muscle is found inferior to the eyeball, runs along the floor of the orbit under the anterior aspect of the eye. This muscle is also innervated by oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve number three, and its action is kind of similar to what we have seen for superior oblique. It also abducts the eyeball, but instead of depressing it, inferior oblique elevates. And if the superior oblique muscle was medially rotating the eyeball, basically inferior oblique will do the opposite, laterally rotating the eyeball. So to cut the long story short, we have four muscles that are called rectus, two that are called oblique, and we have innervation that requires cranial nerves number three, number four, and number six. Cranial nerve number six innervates lateral rectus. Cranial nerve number four innervates superior oblique muscle, while all other muscles, inferior oblique, inferior rectus, medial, and superior rectus are innervated by cranial nerve three, that is the oculomotor nerve. So combination of inferior oblique, superior rectus, just superior rectus on both eyes, superior rectus, inferior oblique muscle, this set, as I mentioned, of nine different pictures will help you identify what kind of movement individual muscles are to do. Picture in the center is that no muscular activity. Our eyes are centered. And when we just open our eyelids, we're looking straight forward. Within the orbit, as we already have this conclusion, we need to have multiple nerves that innervate those six different muscles that move the eyeball. And perhaps we can start here on the left side and observe the gap within the orbit that is called superior orbital fissure. In the center of the screen is the optic nerve together with blood vessel, which feeds the inside of the eyeball, central retinal artery. And around optic nerve, we have this ring, which is very similar to what's illustrated on the right side of the screen, a ring which serves as a common attachment point for practically all the muscles that move eyeball, with exception of inferior oblique. So the superior orbital fissure is the one which would allow fibers of oculomotor nerve to go through, trochlear nerve, it's going to be here, and abducens nerve. So nerves that we need to innervate the muscles are passing through the same landmark. Then we have also the first branch of the fifth cranial nerve. That's the ophthalmic nerve. And it already started branching, so it gave the lacrimal nerve here. It gave the nasociliary nerve also branch of the ophthalmic nerve. And of course, the optic nerve running through its own optic nerve canal of the sphenoid bone. The right side picture identifies oculomotor nerve going to innervate this muscle, this muscle, this muscle, and we're going to have abducens 
innervating lateral rectus, trochlear nerve innervating superior oblique, while oculomotor nerve is then responsible for superior, middle, inferior rectus, and inferior oblique muscle. This picture illustrates content of the orbit with eyeball being removed and also bellies of these ocular muscles being also removed. Certainly is something is as important as our vision. We need to have proper vascular supply within the orbit. And here is where we start, internal carotid artery as it's passing into the cranial vault is giving its important branch that is called ophthalmic artery. Ophthalmic artery is here. This one, which is not necessarily named, but I can add it for you is middle meningeal artery, which eventually will communicate and make some anastomotic connections with other blood vessels. The other side of the screen on the right hand side, you can see ophthalmic artery. And as it is a little bit more simplified view, you can follow and find all of its important branches. Supraorbital arteries here, supratrochlear arteries here, and we have seen them today earlier as arteries that are passing through the orbit but then they get out of the orbit and they supply skin and other underlying structures that are on uh, our forehead. Then we have this branch that yields a zygomatico-temporal artery, giving more vascular supply to a region of temple, and zygomatico-facial artery that is also important to supply uh, skin and subcutaneous structures uh, that are covering area of the zygomatic bone. Supraorbital and supratrochlear branches are here. You can see here branches that are going to lacrimal gland. You are having some no-name branches that are looking like they're ending on the surface of the eyeball, but they end up supplying muscles. And very important landmark that we have to have here it's the central retinal artery, which runs together with the optic nerve entering the eyeball and provides blood supply to the most sensitive retina of the eyeball, helping us detect light. Another way to see arteries, it is external carotid. This is facial artery, diagonally going across the face and in a somewhat darker color, we have supratrochlear and supraorbital arteries that are coming outside of the orbit after they are coming all from branch that we have seen on the previous slide, the branch which is ophthalmic artery that is source of blood for all of the main branches that we're talking about today. Veins of the orbital region appear to be also accompanying the artery. So we would have angular vein, which continues as the facial vein also running diagonally across the face. We have the supratrochlear and supraorbital vein draining blood from same areas where a supraorbital artery and supratrochlear artery supplied, getting into orbit and forming superior ophthalmic vein. Now, superior ophthalmic vein, as you can see, does drain directly into cavernous sinus, and that is something that we, had, we talked about today as a possible link that infective process, which could be located very superficially on the skin of the face, unfortunately could be seen progressed into deeper veins of the orbit and unfortunately also to the cavernous sinus. Speaking of sinuses, within the skull, we know that we have a set of different dural sinuses that are there in lieu of larger veins that would drain venous blood from the brain. 
One of them is the cavernous sinus, which you can see here and connected to superficial veins of the face via superior ophthalmic vein. Now, on this diagram, we can name other sinuses. This is superior sagittal sinus, which receives blood from both left and right cerebral hemispheres. It travels from front under parietal bone to occipital bone, staying in the midline. And at the level of external occipital protuberance, which you can see a little bit better on the right side of the screen, superior sagittal sinus is splitting into left and right transverse sinuses. So this is left-sided, this is right-sided transverse sinus. Superior sagittal sinus is accompanied by inferior sagittal sinus, which is sitting in the midline as well within this fold of dura that is called cerebral falx. And it is also in between left and right cerebral hemispheres. When it reaches the area where falx meets tentorium cerebelli, inferior sagittal sinus becomes sinus rectus, straight sinus, which reaches also the area where superior sagittal sinus splits into left and right transverse sinuses. As the transverse sinus goes forward, basically it hits the petrous part of the temporal bone. And that part of the bone forces the sinus to make S-shaped turn hence the name sigmoid sinus, and direct it towards the jugular foramen. At this point, after sigmoid sinus passes through the jugular foramen, we're going to have quick conversion that sigmoid sinus actually becomes, as it exits the skull, internal jugular vein. There are a few more sinuses, such as this one, superior, inferior, petrous sinuses, cavernous sinus, they're all connected. And of course, all of them serve to drain the venous blood from the brain. But superior sagittal transfers, sigmoid are definitely the largest and therefore the most significant form of dural sinuses that we use to identify proper drainage of the venous blood from cranial cavity. Picture on the left still identifies the lacrimal gland in the upper lateral corner of the orbit. And then through multiple secretory ducts, it is excreting tears directly into conjunctival sac in between conjunctiva that covers anterior surface of the eyeball. And palpebral conjunctiva covering the inside of the eyelids. With movement of eyelids, tears are evenly spread over the surface of an eye and pushed towards medial side of the eyeball, where uh, next to the nose, both upper and lower eyelids connect to each other. And of course, at that point, tears will be drained directly into canal that opens inside the nasal cavity. On the right side, it's the picture that we have. So we have white of an eye, which is called the sclera. It is covered with conjunctiva. And under conjunctiva, we can see multiple very small caliber blood vessels. This is conjunctival sac, which is a little space between conjunctiva covering the eyeball versus conjunctiva that is lining the inner aspect of the eyelid. Our eye, eye, eyelashes and this arrow here points to this little dark spot that's called the punctum and that is where canaliculus from the inferior eyelid starts draining tears into nasal acrimal duct. As this becomes the new topic, I would prefer to continue and have it all done in one continuous recording. 
the nose itself. As seen on the left side of the screen, connection between nasal bones to frontal bone generates part of the nose that is called the root. From root, we're going all the way to tip of the nose, following the back of the nose, which is called the dorsum of the nose. Nose expands sideways to produce nasal ala or wing. And of course, we're gonna see opening on the left and right side that is called the nares. And we would also be able to see in between left and right nares, one smaller part of the nasal septum. Using just diagram that illustrates the structure of the external nose itself, now we can confirm left and right nasal bones that go from the nasal root forming dorsum. But here it's multiple nasal cartilages that will continue running all the way to the apex. So the external nose is partly bony and partly cartilaginous. Multiple nasal cartilages are present. However, I'm going to emphasize just one which stays in the midline and we're going to see it on the next slide, that is gray colored septal cartilage. As you can see, part of the septum that we built between perpendicular plate of ethmoid bone and vomer is just the solid part of the septum. We need to fill in the gap between two bones and to run septum all the way to the tip of the nose. That is gonna be done with a septal cartilage. This is the one which becomes at fault for people who have deviated nasal septum, which means sometimes there is a disproportionate growth between the cartilage and other bones of the facial skeleton, which forces the cartilage to become skewed to one side or the other, resulting in its deviation and somewhat more nasal type of speech. Within either half of the nasal space, we know that ethmoid bone will send two projections, superior and middle concha, to project into nasal cavities, while the third and lowest position, inferior nasal concha, is practically individual bone of the facial skeleton. The roof of the nasal space is ethmoid bone, it's cribriform plate and those little openings that you can see here would allow olfactory fibers to pass from inside the cranial cavity into upper third of the nasal space, enabling us to detect different scented, scented molecules, different smells. The floor of the oral cavity actually is what is the roof of the oral cavity. Floor of the nasal cavity is hard palate and partly soft palate as well. So depending from which direction you are looking at it, one structure could be seen as the floor of nasal cavity, but it's the, at the same time, the roof of the oral cavity. What is interesting is that air as it moves through the nasal cavity moves fairly quickly. And as a result of its run, basically it is, having a lots of turbulence, and it is due to position of superior, middle, and inferior nasal conchae. They create turbulence, forcing the air to pass in between them through three passageways, three hallways, that are known as the superior, middle, and inferior nasal meatus. Meatus means hallway. At the same time, during first 10, 15, 20 years of our life, as we inhale and exhale, nasal mucous membrane is ballooning and expanding into spongy part of some of the neighboring bones. As a result of that, we would start seeing formation of cavities within four different bones of the cranial and facial skeleton. Those cavities will communicate directly with the nasal cavity and air that fills them will be replaced with subsequent inhalatory effort. Nasal cavity and the mucous membrane that lines it, together with the mucous membrane that's lining sinuses, basically will 
act as a trap for any foreign particles because it's sticky and it's wet. It will also add moisture, it will add heat. So as the air runs through the nose and goes in and out of paranasal sinuses, it essentially becomes prepared for passing further down into lower airways without fear of us inhaling lots of dirt, lots of dust, lots of foreign particles. Chances are that they're gonna be trapped and would held within the nasal cavity. You can see on this picture, two fairly large cavities that are paranasal sinuses. One is within the frontal bone and the other one is within the body of the sphenoid bone. Sinus within the frontal bone is found posterior and deep to superciliary arches, a little bit of elevation that frontal bone has under our eyebrows and to the root of the nose. This sinus has a natural opening and it would drain into middle nasal meatus. The sphenoid sinus is here within the body of sphenoid bone. And two more sinuses we need to address. One is quite large and it is within the maxilla, the maxillary sinus. It's the largest of all these associated cavities to nasal space, adjacent to nose, adjacent to teeth of the upper jaw, and it drains also into middle nasal meatus. The most complicated one are multiple spaces that are called ethmoid air cells. You can see here on this diagram four that are colored in green, and you're gonna have the same number of spaces without green color on the right side. So they're all cumulatively forming uh, smaller spaces known as the ethmoidal air cells, and they count as the ethmoid bone paranasal sinuses. They open into middle and the superior nasal meatus, but of these four, Basically, the most common problems that people would have either is inflammation of maxillary sinus or on the previous slide, inflammatory change affecting the frontal sinus. Surface anatomy would be a little bit easier now as we know it. Basically, these two yellow colored spaces are reflections in surface projection of the frontal sinus multiple green colored spaces, ethmoidal sinus or ethmoidal cells. And then finally in blue, we're gonna have projection of left and right sided maxillary sinuses onto surface of our face. Sphenoid sinus, as you can see, is way more recessed. It sits within the body of the sphenoid bone. And that is what we have as additional spaces that are making part of the airways. Nose, because of its ability to do heat exchange, is also quite well vascularly supplied. Uh, think about inhaling very cold winter air. Let's say temperature of air is minus 5, 10, or 15. As you let such a cold air pass over 37 degrees Celsius heated surface, air which moves is going to pick enough heat and as it travels further down into lower part of the airways will already be will be prepared as optimal temperature which would do no further harm to larynx uh, trachea bronchi or lungs that is the reason for which you have quite unexpectedly large number of blood vessels that are seen within nasal cavity so we have here on the far right side of the screen, internal carotid, which is not too relevant, but external carotid artery that gives one of the branches that is called the sphenopalatine artery. Sphenopalatine artery basically is going to spread its terminal branches all over the lateral surface of the nose. And it is also going to be a source of 
blood which comes and covers the heart palate, but from the oral cavity side. Branches of the ophthalmic artery are also entering into nasal cavity, giving us posterior ethmoidal or anterior ethmoidal arteries. Then we have maxillary artery that is giving a branch, the sphenopalatine branch, and then facial artery also will add a little bit of extra blood into nasal cavity. Since we have so many and so uh, blood vessels that create so many anastomotic connections between them, the medial wall of the nasal cavity, this is practically the nasal septum, you still have the same posterior anterior ethmoidal arteries as well as sphenopalatine artery branch of the maxillary. However, this time we're focusing on this area, practically very much on the anterior part of the nasal septum. This is where most of the nosebleeds come from. It's the Kisselbach's area where you can see like huge number of individually connected blood vessels. So any kind of physical stress, poking into nasal cavity, allowing mucous membrane to eventually dry out may result in its bursting and subsequent nosebleed would come. Most likely it is coming then from this area, which is called the Kieselbach's area, area of highest vascular supply within medial wall of the nose. Certainly within the nasal cavity, the most important nerve that we have to add is the olfactory nerve cranial nerve number one, which carries special signals of smell. Individual small fibers that are passing into nasal cavity, they have to go through ethmoid bone through its cribriform plate, and they would enter within upper third of the nasal cavity. All the individual olfactory fibers come from olfactory nerve or olfactory tract and its anterior most enlargement, which is called the olfactory bulb, that sits directly superior over the uh, cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. So interestingly enough, just upper third of the nasal cavity is having olfactory fibers. Therefore, it's another reason for us to believe that turbulent flow of air as it passes through the nasal cavity will bring any of the scented molecules close to the upper third and they would be detected and therefore our reaction to smell will be the most appropriate. So this is olfactory tract, this is olfactory bulb and these are individual olfactory nerve fibers that are passing through cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Here is another illustration that brings olfactory nerve, olfactory bulb, and olfactory fibers into place. However, we still need to illustrate what additionally innervates the nasal cavity. Internal aspect of the cavity is innervated by branches of ophthalmic nerve, first branch of the trigeminal, maxillary nerve, second branch of the trigeminal nerve, they are here marked with number one and number two. This is ophthalmic nerve, which is entering into the orbit, but these are its peripheral branches that are coming from this nerve. So we can say that upper half of the nasal cavity is innervated by ophthalmic branches of trigeminal nerve, while maxillary nerve is gonna cover the rest of it, so lower half. Externally, it is going to be, again, shared responsibility between ophthalmic nerve, cranial nerve number five, first branch, and maxillary nerve that's going to take care of more lateral aspect of the external nose. Finally, we have one interesting clinical consideration, and that is Bell's palsy. Basically, it's the facial nerve which could be trapped and affected by some change, either it's of viral origin 
caused by chicken pox or shingle virus, Epstein-Barr virus or influenza B type of virus, which forces the ner nerve to swell. But as the part of the nerve runs through a very tight canal of the temporal bone, swelling of a nerve actually is what starts choking the nerve as it runs through the bone. As a result of that, nerve practically becomes impaired for as long as this kind of swelling is in place and until it starts regressing, we cannot expect any type of improvement. This is paralysis of facial nerve that is called the peripheral type because it's directly the main trunk of the nerve which is affected by this change. And certainly as the five individual branches that we talked about, temporal branch, zygomatic branch, buccal branch, uh, marginal mandibular branch, cervical branch, all of them become impaired due to problems that affect the main trunk of the nerve. Basically we have complete paralysis of muscles on the ipsilateral side of the face. In this case, if a person is asked to either close their eyes or to show the teeth or wrinkle the forehead, it's going to look something like this. Asked to wrinkle the forehead will require us to observe symmetrical movement affecting both sides of the forehead. When told to close their eyes, a patient would be able to symmetrically close both eyes and if they're instructed to close it firmly, you are looking at any signs of asymmetry between left and right. Finally, to test muscles of the lower face, we're going to ask the patient to show their teeth. And of course, again, we're looking at symmetrical stretch of upper and lower lips and corners of our mouth. Person with a bell palsy would be unable to do this in a symmetric form. They would practically do this when told to raise or wrinkle the skin of their forehead, they're going to do it like this. One side will be properly raised while the other one will be practically without visible contractions. When told to close their eyes, they're going to do it like this. One side, one eye will remain open. And when told to show their teeth, they would be able to see uh, to show only half of their teeth and there is obvious asymmetry that we can see. So muscles on one side of the face are paralyzed. A patient may have increased sensitivity to sound because the facial nerve as it runs through temporal bone also innervates two very small muscles that are practically holding in place and preventing them of moving quite dramatically fast. Those little ossicles, malleus incus and stapes. So their movement is now uncontrolled. They move quite violently. And that is what results in a sound being practically without any kind of dampening. That is why we become oversensitive to sound. A, a lack of ability to properly close upper and lower lips might result in spontaneous drooling of saliva. And the facial nerve, which also innervates about two thirds of the tongue uh, taste wise, is also going to affect. So loss of taste is gonna be part of the problem that we have during these acute signs of problems for the facial nerve. Change in tear in the saliva production it's because the facial nerve carries also some of the parasympathetic fibers. And if the entire nerve is affected, of course, those parasympathetic fibers will be affected as well. So we're here at the end. As I mentioned it, you're going to have some interesting acupuncture points that you would have to go through a little bit later. But for us, for tomorrow, we're to see each other in lab number five, upper limb, and then your assignment, module five, is going to be due on Wednesday, 28th of February. Our next lecture, February 29th, not the March 29th, is going to be on Thursday. We have second lecture on the head. And Friday, March 1st, then we're going to have lab about the head 
and uh, module six will be due week after Wednesday, March the 6th. I believe that this would be enough and good enough for complementing today's lecture, and I am trying just to make it as short as it can be. See you tomorrow. Thank you for watching it. I hope it is going to be also good as the lecture itself. Thank you very much. Have fun. See you tomorrow.